this is a topic so near and dear to my heart that I actually, um, I'm so proud to be moderating this one. Um, and I, I really hate the word moderating. I love unplugged conversations. So just jump in and let's talk about everything that is so important. And, and what I really love about this conversation is it's so solution oriented. It is so action oriented. It is so collaborative oriented. And you know, in our world of diversity and inclusivity, what pisses me off the most is how siloed we've been as an industry. Everyone territory turfing, you know, oh, I have this great idea, but I'm gonna keep it close to the vest, and I have this great idea, and we're all working on the same damn thing separately. Well, what a waste of money, first of all. We don't have that kind of time. If we could just collaborate and say, here we are, here's where we wanna go, and share our secrets and best practices and turn them into easy toolkits and next step change, we will actually close the wage gap. We will actually reach equality sooner than as McKinsey predicts it taking over 118 years. So I don't know about you people on this in this conversation, but that seems like a shitload of time to me that I'm not willing to wait for, right? We don't want to do this, right? No, 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 no. 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 So we, we want to work together. And this is a group that has raised their hand to say, we're going to work together, right? Right. Right. OK, so that's why I'm happy to be here, because this is a happy team. And I, I, I think we learn a lot from sports, the power of team. You know, you can't be successful if you're one on a team that is really good, you gotta all share and, and work together. So that's a long introduction to a conversation that I said I'm not prepared for, but I'm prepared because I live and breathe this every second of every day, um, and I'm very passionate about it. But the topic is called diversity is an action. Inclusion is cultural, which I'm obsessed with. And you know, we've been working on something called the Modern Guide to Equality, which was interviewing corporate leaders on Next Step Change. And then all of a sudden, this playbook shows up that I was obsessed with. Really, I sent it around to my team, like, oh my god, this is amazing. We all have to work together. And then there was another playbook from uh, 72 and Sunny. I'm like, oh my god. And I said to 72 and Sunny that were here, I said, we all have to work together. And what they said was, of course we do. And that was just music to my ears. So I'm going to have each of you introduce yourself. Um, first of all, what you do, but I don't want to give a whole long biography because I don't really care. <laughs> what I care more about is why this matters and you know why you're here. So let's start down. Okay. okay. My name is Gina Larkin and I'm an ex-marketing executive turned transformational leadership coach and I work primarily with women, so that's why I'm here. Uh, inclusivity. And I, I feel like with women, I want to help them tap into their inner genius and their inner best self so that they can reach their full potential and find meaning in their lives. And that works in the workplace and it works in your personal life. It's one big messy life, so why not, why not have that as your goal? And what you're offering in companies to those inclusivity conversations is really, really important. So there's a lot of steps that we can do as coaches to help people get ready for those conversations and make contributions in the companies. Fantastic. <clears throat> um, so my name is Nadine Dietz, and I am uh, most recently the author of a playbook that Shelly is holding in her hands. It, it's really oh. big, <laughs> but it is awesome. Awesome. It's, it's got really a, good. Oh, thank you. <laughs> it's a lot of plays from a lot of really amazing people. And, you know, I went to a leadership retreat a year ago, and I was challenged uh, to ask myself what my mission was in life, what my vision was, what my purpose was. And the only thing I could really think of is I like to help people. And um, I've been fortunate and honored and blessed to have some really amazing friends that I love to tell their stories. And many of them are here. And uh, together with 30 top CMOs, we created this playbook for other CMOs to elevate their leadership and their ability to develop talent on their teams. And that's my purpose. That's my mission. So to extend that work, I launched a podcast recently called CMO Moves, where I bring the real deal to life. You know, let's forget about what you've already read in the news about some of these great people. I'm glad to say these two will be some of my first two guests. Um, but it's about what it's really like to be a CMO. What do you have to deal with every day? What were your best moments? How did you develop your teams? What was maybe your worst moment? And let's use that to help everybody in the industry grow 
um, it, their, not just their leadership skills, but their self-development skills. I think also just what's so interesting about that, and we'll talk about it, is the role of CMO today. Yes. How it is evolving from just being chief marketing officer to, in my opinion, being chief culture officer Absolutely. and really, you know, inspiring your teams to be better um, in so many ways. And mm -hmm. so with that, you know, let's talk to a former CMO from McDonald's. <laughs> <laughs> Hi, everyone. Deborah Wall, former CMO from McDonald's, and I'm also vice chair of the ANA right now. Um, if I look back on what's built me, I have worked on three continents in four languages and in five different industries. And as I look at that, what I've learned through all that experience is the idea of how important diversity is, diversity of thought, how when you speak different languages, you actually think differently and then can problem solve in very different ways. So I fundamentally believe that that is a key to our success. Part of the CMO agenda is about, um, we have to be focused on growth overall. And we grow by coming up with innovative solutions and category development and really furthering the discussion, which then all goes back to diversity of thought and people and input. And so um, for me, that's a passion point. Um, I'm thrilled to see how much focus there is now because I have to say seven years ago, it, this topic sort of disappeared from the agenda mm -hmm. um, because it was too controversial and there were legal issues and all that. So. We're beyond that, and then I have to um, thank you know the nemesis of Trump and his agenda because it sort of helped spur the conversation again. Um, and I'm really uh, excited about the possibilities and where growth can go, and excited to do anything I can to play my role in that. Like her, I've uh, experienced diversity firsthand. At, at, at one point in time, I didn't know what a non-diverse world was until I started working in the domestic division of the United States. Um, uh, and, and, and therefore, that was one of my wake-up calls as to the need for transformation, because at the end of the day, it is not only scientifically proven, but my experience has been diverse teams perform better, deliver better innovation, and fundamentally deliver better results. I also have a very selfish reason for being here. I'm the, the father of five daughters. So uh, I am not, not only am I not willing to, uh, to wait 180 years, but I don't want my daughters to have to wait 180 years. So the whole, the whole notion of gender equality and diversity is, is very, very, very personal for me. So I'm, I thank Shelly for inviting me again. We told Antonio, once you get in, you don't get out. So he's our, he's our man ambassador and he's stuck with us. Sorry, not sorry. Oops. <laughs> Um, hi, everybody. I'm Jenny Rooney. I'm the editor of the CMO Network at Forbes. And um, it's my job to talk to CMOs all the time. Um, so I've kind of had sort of a, a fun opportunity to see patterns and trends um, from an outsider looking in vantage point. Um, and in doing that, you get to know not just sort of who these people are on paper, but you get to know them as individuals and who they truly are and what drives them. And um, the personal is powerful, right? And that is driving the agendas of many CMOs right now to make this a priority. Um, you know, I always think in terms of, and, and by the way, I'm usually the moderator on panels, so it's really weird for me to be a panelist. Help yourself, girl. <laughs> Knock yourself I'm out. I'm just going to be like, but, but what about that? Do you want? I don't want to hold you back. Um, but, you know, so I think a lot in terms of uh, don't talk in generalities. Tell me specifics, right? Tell me case studies. Tell me real world anecdotes of how you're actually getting things done. Um, and so I think we're seeing that happen now more than ever. Obviously, this has been an important topic for forever and ever. It's not a new topic, it's not a new priority, but I think the way that we're seeing CMOs approach it is a priority. Um, and I also think we're seeing it in ways that are uh, more, I use that word codified, which I don't really like it, but it kind of like essentially is a way to, 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 to summarize um, how we're making it tactical, right? And I think that that's super important. Certainly, uh, the ANA's um, you know talent challenge playbook is is one is one enormous way of doing that. Um, certainly, the things that HP has done, um, and Antonio's taking sort of his position of influence. He was one of our Forbes World's Most Influential CMOs this year. Um, Woohoo! Yes, yeah. very nice. Um, and I'll talk more about that as we get into it. You know, it's recognizing that responsibility that comes with that exposure and uh, that um, that influence. And so it's 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 diving into these these passion points and these um, priorities um, that is causing certain CMOs to sort of rise to the fore as um, as real workers to the end of this cause. So, 
Okay, so let's go to that. Let's go to responsibility. Mm -hmm. To me, responsibility belongs first within ourselves to be conscious and say we can be better. Um, and then it goes to accountability for change. So I saw this video, it, it's old, I think, but it blew my mind and it was called Make Your Bed. Did you see it by a, oh, yeah. a general yeah, yeah, yeah. in the, the, the Navy SEALs? Holy shit. And so what it showed was <laughs> it starts with a task. And he says, it, make your bed every day. He says, start with that task. And then go to work. And that task leads to another task, leads to another task. And even if you have a really shitty day, you come back to a made bed. And a made bed by you. And I was so inspired. And he talked about, you know, in the Navy SEALs, you know, there were 40 guys with six boats or whatever. And the boat that did the best was the boat of the munchkins. It was the littlest guys that were five feet five. You know, it wasn't the big ones. Why? Because they were a boat of diversity. There was an Indian American. There was an African American. There were two cute guys from the Midwest. You know what? It was a boat of diversity, and that's why it did. It was. It was so compelling. I was like, wow, and I was like screaming. And so let's go down this path of what task? Give me a task that you have achieved that you're so proud of that's going to lead you to your next task. Let's start with you, Deborah, since I see you open <laughs> like, no, ready no, to don't go. Start with me. <laughs> I saw you like, "Oh, I had tasks with that getting out of." So, um, hmm, personally is um, my task right now is uh, I'm very um, excited about and passionate about what's happening in Detroit because it is all about a mayor with a vision that we're better together and a city for all of us. So every day my task is to read about urban planning so that I can bring that back to Detroit to um, advance something. Now, can I go to my agency world? Yes. That, okay. Can you go to your agency <laughs> so world? The, the agency world. Um, Are you asking permission? Yeah. <laughs> I was like, like, I'm like, no, to, no, I am, no. like, I'm a very big rule follower. She said, talk about a task. Personally, I will talk about a task. And I break every rule, so we're a good pair. <laughs> Just bring me along with you. I'm going to give you the T-shirt that says Chief Troublemaker. It'll inspire you to break some more rules. <laughs> I need it. Um, so we, did, we set a task. Like, uh, I think one of the issues of the diversity discussion today is just um, is streamlining, like taking out blockers or any obstacles so that you can streamline the process. So we set a simple task for the agencies at McDonald's where we said, we want every um, multicultural agency to have a seat at the table to be a part of every single discussion because it opens eyes up dramatically. And you could see day by day uh, the knowledge and uh, work changing because of that. That's fantastic. And I, I think that one of the things that, you know, I was just talking to the CEO of the Girl Scouts, and I don't know why this is so complicated. What she said is, we spend like two point something billion dollars or something like that, don't quote me on that, with vendors. Mm -hmm. And then we started looking at our vendors and realized that our vendors don't have diversity. And so she said, she sent out some RF RFP and said, if you don't have at least 30% diversity girls because she's the girl scouts yeah. on your team that works for us we're not going to use you well guess what happens you all of a sudden create yeah. right. <laughs> the change that's necessary antonio what are you doing at hp so precisely what what you said you said um you you bring bring the different parties together you um have them set their own goals uh in in our particular case 12 months ago we asked our agencies that they needed to um, diversify, that they needed to place a lot more uh, women in senior roles, particularly in the creative department, and they needed to increase the, the number of uh, underrepresented minorities or people of color in, uh, in our account as well. Um, and like you said, this is a plan. A plan has an objective. A plan has measurements. A plan has tactics. And 12 months later, um, I feel incredibly proud that we were able to move significantly the number of women in our account from 40 to 61 percent. The number of people in our, in, in our senior roles, today 51 percent of the people leading our account around the world are women. When we started, many of the agencies had zero, zero leaders in our, uh, on our account. And then on the creative department, our two leading agencies, which are BBDNO and Fred and Farid, now have 
uh, one has 40% um, uh, and the other one has 55% women. So the, the approach works. Like any, like any change management process works, and it, and it has to be taken that seriously. That's the great news. The one that so I feel very proud of that about that. What I don't feel proud of, of is that we were not as disciplined and as thorough in increasing the number of underrepresented minorities at the same time. We did make some progress, but we were not able to achieve what the agencies themselves said to achieve. So that's going to be the single-minded focus for 2018, and to ensure that no nothing slips back on the women front, because I fundamentally believe that if we don't keep our eye on the ball, things are going to slip back to where they were. So I, I just want to share something. First of all, you should not not be proud of anything that you have not done, because what you are doing is nothing shy of remarkable. Oh, thank you. And I learned something My team yesterday. Did that. <laughs> I, but I want to tell you something. I learned something yesterday, and I want to share it with you. I learned about a concept called, from Carol Dweck wrote this, about a growth mindset, and it's called not yet. So I just want to say to you, not yet. You haven't hit your quotas yet or your numbers or your you know, levels that you want yet. I agree with that. But you certainly are going to because you are determined. So we will. It's not yet. I love it. I'm okay. going to use it. Good. I'm going to give you credit for it. That's Give Carol credit. Shelly says, not yet. <laughs> Shelly says what Carol said. Um, but I thought it was, it was worth sharing. I thought it was really remarkable. Okay, so now let's move on. Can I, can I just say something that I, I think has been missing on, on, the, on the conversation, which is, um, you know, we talk about the, going back to the cultural element of it, we, we talk a lot about the fact that we need to increase representation and we're gonna do it, and we talk about inclusion and we talk about unconscious bias. Somehow there's this perception that managing diverse groups is fun, it's easy, it's kumbaya. One day we're gonna do the Latin thing, another one we're gonna do the <laughs> rap thing, and another one we're gonna do the Midwestern thing, and everybody's gonna be happy. It's damn hard. It's hard. It is damn hard. And, and one of the, uh, as, as, we was go, uh, as I was going through my own personal journey here, one of the things that I read, I think it was at UCLA and MIT working together, they did this study and said, you know, obviously, diverse teams will beat homogeneous teams every time, which we already knew. What I found incredibly interesting is that the homogeneous group, during their path, they were feeling great. We're going towards a mission. We're going to achieve our goal. Everyone cheering each other out, they lost. The diverse team had a miserable time going through the process. <laughs> miserable time until they achieved the target and said, oh, actually, that wasn't too bad. <laughs> no one is telling us how hard it is. Sometimes, it, honestly, I, I love my team, and I have uh, one of my leaders here, Karen Kahn, who's a very strong, opinionated person, and I have other people that think fundamentally She's not bossy. Than no, she's not. <laughs> <laughs> She's not. But, but sometimes after the meeting, you're exhausted. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> it is exhausting. But you have to embrace that because you know at the end that the outcome is going to be better. But we have to call it what it is. It is hard work, and it's not easy. Right. Yeah, but if it were easy, you know, we wouldn't be talking about it. And so you know, no pain, no gain. But I, I, and I want to get to a lot of questions, but I have to ask you a question, Antonio, with that, which is you have worked successfully on you know, bringing more women into the organization at, at every level. Do you find your business changing? Or you know, is it just that you now have, you know, are you filling quotas or are you finding the table different? No, the table is completely, um, completely different. The, the discussions are significantly richer. And again, I, I don't have the data yet to be able to tell you this uh, specific business initiative had this. Let me go back. We measured three things at the end of the day. The, the impact on our business, the impact on our brand, and the impact of, of the very specific initiative that we're trying to drive. The first two we don't have yet, but the impact of the, some of the initiatives that we're driving, we're beginning to see. So when we have a, 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 a diverse team in the client side, we have a diverse team at the agency side, and then you take it a step further and you bring female women director to produce that work, 
that actually research will prove that connects at a deeper level that has a bigger impact and it scores higher than some of the other stuff that we did. That we're, we're beginning to record we're, so that we can one day publish with the data saying, you know, this works. These are the business results associated with it. That's fantastic. So let's go, Nadine, to you with this playbook that, you know, I'm obsessed with. And <laughs> I mean, it just, it blew my mind and I'm so inspired and impressed. So thank you for taking this big giant step. Give me some examples, you know, from companies. We just heard from Antonio, who's a major feature in this playbook and you know I read word for word which I really never do I used to do <laughs> every word, you know kind of thing right yeah. but I did I, I read every word which is unusual for me what kind of other examples you know are you yeah. uncovering in how companies are advancing diversity and inclusivity um, in the workplace yeah I, I think um, the the proper way to probably answer that is just to start by acknowledging something really quickly that Antonio said, and that being a CMO is really, really hard. And when we all got together um, to try to put this playbook uh, together, Jenny's been part of it longer than I have actually since last year. It was actually Jeff Jones from Target when he was CMO Target, now he's CEO at H&R Block, said, we have a real problem in marketing. Uh, we have a, a growing deficit of talent. Nobody even knows what we do anymore. We lack credibility in the C-suite. We have got to overcome ginormous hurdles with the way that the world is changing. The empowered consumer is driving business faster than we can keep up. Technology is moving faster than we can keep up. And oh, by the way, we have to deal with diversity and inclusion, right? And um, you know, it's just really, really hard. And you know, I think, um, and I had a lot of guidance along the way. Uh, Deborah is the vice chair of the ANA, so she and I had a lot of conversations about what this needs to be. I've talked to Antonio quite a bit about how he's been able to essentially become a, a role model for other CMOs, which is why he's one of these uh, featured leaders in this book. Um, and I think it has to do with taking a breath and understanding that you can't just go out into the world and say what you think you are. You have to be who you are. And the most important thing that I learned in this process, and there's a whole chapter on um, what we call it the culture chapter. It's about inspiring and connecting cultures because it's all about diversity. It's all about, more importantly, I think, inclusion at this point. Mm -hmm. um, because inclusion is really a product of the culture that you're fostering and that you're inspiring. And when you look at people like Jonathan Middenhall at Airbnb, uh, you know, his mission is to build the world's first multicultural brand. And he's in the playbook because he's done some amazing things. For six years at Airbnb, they spent all their energy not focused on what they were telling people that were their hosts and their guests, or i.e. customers, of who they were. They were living and breathing and proving it on the inside with their AirFam, which are their employees. I've read reports before from major institutions that talk about employees as users. What the hell is a user, right? That's a person you're talking about. And culture is where humans gather, right? And, and that's a quote from Stan Slap, and you know, I put him in the book because most people define culture as a product of values. Where is that human in that definition? There isn't even a mention of a human being. It's a group of people who collect together that have a shared understanding of what the rules of engagement are. And they learn that from everywhere from the top down. And so as a leader, it's your responsibility to state the values and the mission and live by them. You can't say to the rest of the world, oh, our brand is so awesome and we're, we're all about inclusion. And then you're so hard on the people that you work for. You know, you're somebody like sending emails at the two o'clock in the morning when you, know, you get to go to sleep, but they don't, right? Um, so this, that's just one tiny example. But you know, at the end of the day, there's Jonathan, we, we featured also, um, Rick Gomez, CMO of Target. Great guy. You know, amazing. You know, his whole story was it's not about just being customer centric, it's about being empathetic and it's about having real conversations. And Rick goes out, and you may have had a conversation with Rick and you don't know it because he doesn't tell anybody he's CMO of Target. And he spends three hours he's with people. He's an undercover boss. He's an undercover boss, right? And he's learning on what it means to really connect. What are the trials and tribulations of the people I am serving? You know, their guest center of excellence does all this research where they say, here's $20, go out and try to, you know, shop for food to feed your family for a week, see if you can do it. And the head of his guest center of excellence came back and said, it's appalling. You cannot feed a family nutritious food on $20 a week. So what are we going to do about that? So anyways, those are just a couple examples. They're all in the playbook. We have so many great examples. But 
It's about owning who you are, stating what you are, and living it, and being true to your values. And change happens at every level. You Absolutely. don't have to be the CEO of a company. I mean, you know, you CEO of a company has to implement, but it really, leadership is every single level. Absolutely. We all can lead in different ways. I want to go, I'm going to come oh, back to, you oh, know, sorry, actually, one little quick, that I forgot to just kind of close the loop on what you said. And that is when you are that kind of a leader, when you have that kind of culture, when you are driven by purpose, people want to work for you. And then they want to work together against a common mission. And it's about igniting passion and having people connect on a value that's different than just, I said so. Well, I so, think millennials sorry. today, you know, we say they're the next generation, they're the now generation. Yes, exactly. And they want to work for companies that want to make the world a better place. So, you know, shame on companies that think they're going to get away with not, you know, doing good. Right. Because they will not attract and retain the best talent anymore. So that will correct itself. Um, I want to go to Jenny from a Forbes perspective. You know, what is your perspective today? First of all, I love Myra Forbes. I mean, she's, hi Myra. I love her. We all do. Right? I mean, just a shout out to Myra. She's, she's awesome. Um, but Jenny, from, I mean, you guys are doing so many things showcasing and highlighting, you know, CMOs as you talked about. What's your perspective today um, that's working and what's not working? Yeah, well, I mean, um, <laughs> yeah, no. Um, <laughs> and you, you mentioned Moira, and it's great because, I mean, I, I work arguably for the Forbes CMO network, so I'm, that's my main focus, but I collaborate so much. You know, the, the Forbes women practice, we co collaborate. Um, we've done events in um, Silicon Valley where we've had um, gathered um, women CMOs from the Valley together to um, talk about how how women can secure board spots. You know, that's so important right now. Um, so we try to kind of give content and direction to, um, you know, to women in leadership roles, um, certainly across industries, but no less so in marketing, of course. Um, you know, I think at the end of the day, the issue is, um, I mean, there's a couple things. As Antonio said, like, you have to, CMOs are under the gun to prove business results as never before. Their budgets didn't come back after the recession. So, you know, the whole concept of doing more with less, um, you know, they're struggling with agency relationships. What's the optimal partnership that they, you know, need to strike? Um, they're under the gun from, you know, others in the C-suite and board members to obviously um, have successful financial results. So it, you have to connect those dots as a CMO to, to these efforts and good business, you know? And that sounds so sort of trite and unfortunately fundamental, but it is. And that's what, you know, especially if you're gonna be a CMO who's successful. Um, so that's a big challenge, right? And I think the more that you can quantify that what you're doing is good for business, as Antonio is, is so strongly focused on, um, you're gonna be successful. Um, just as an aside, you know, another thing that I do for fun at Forbes is we have our big For Forbes 30 Under 30 franchise, which is every year where we look at 30 individuals under age 30 in, I think it's 15 different categories right now, um, who are, I mean, the bar is they literally have to be changing the world. Um, and That's a low bar. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> That's your chief. Yeah. Don't ask me what I was doing when I was 25. I was <laughs> eating Cheetos and watching, you know, um, General Hospital, but um, I loved Laura and Luke. <laughs> <laughs> the perm, it was, it was awesome. Um, but you know, it's it's fascinating for me to sort of be um, engaging with CMOs of a certain um, experience and tenure on sort of one side, and then also engaging with these young people who are coming up in the industry on the other, and seeing them as completely colorblind, completely, they do, don't see barriers, and they approach the marketplaces like, I, why, why shouldn't I be running a company? You know, and it's, it's women, it's people <laughs> of color. I mean, it's, it, it, there is no barrier um, for, arguably, for the next generation coming up through the ranks, and I think that's su super inspiring. And if you just look, the other issue that really fascinates me per personally is, is just generally the talent challenge that all marketers um, are facing right now, both client-side marketers, but also the agencies, and having companies like an HP, um, like a Ford, you know, like a um, uh, Mondelez, I mean, you know, any kind of company in any kind of sector that, um, you know, has been established for quite a while, attracting the same kind of people, the young people that, um, frankly, the, the startups or the Googles and the Facebooks, we all talk about that all the time. Um, so, you know, that alone is a challenge, and then to layer this this over it um, sort of m makes the challenge all the more 
um, complicated. Um, but I think that um, certainly the next generation is inspiring, and these are the people that once they get into companies, they're going to make do, make amazing things happen. And I do think that if we don't think of it as necessarily a top-down thing, but really we're, we're sort of pulling from, from those resources that are coming in at all levels of company, that's where change is going to happen as well. So um, I think the future looks bright in that regard. So, the, 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 Can I just add something to what she said, which I think it's incredibly important, which is the only reason that I have permission to drive the diversity agenda is because I have proven my credentials to actually be able to drive the business. Mm -hmm. If I was just the diversity person, I don't think I would be in my chair right. today. And, and, I, and I think one of the things that uh, Jenny said, and, and we need to, honestly, we need to discuss this as a function more broadly. I think that we've become an island surrounded by mirrors. Coming from Puerto Rico, I can say what an island is. Mm -hmm. um, it, it's it's um, our conversations. Surrounded by, by mirrors. mirrors, meaning meaning we are we are we are talking to ourselves. Even the fundamental questions about the industry, which is 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 it is two seconds of you or three seconds of you is fifty percent pixel. Is this when we share that with our business colleagues, they look like, what are you guys smoking? Right. <laughs> what 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 about driving the revenue line? So I think as a discipline, and I think there's an entire industry around us, including including journalists, including CMO networks, including associations like the INA, they need to, we need to change the conversation so that it always starts with what we're here to do is to drive revenue. By the way, this is what we're doing. Oh, and by the way, media, this is where, where it fits with the overall agenda. Otherwise, the tenure of the CMO is going to continue to reduce and we are going to lose our seat at the, at the management table. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, first of all, who loves Antonio? Hello. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Thank you. But it's, you, it's really true. You know, I don't know why we just can't learn from who wants to be a millionaire. I mean, you know, like seriously, 50-50, you know, you get that option. Or phone a friend if they don't have an it topic expertise, they're going to fail. Or ask the audience, which is right, I think, 94% of the time. You know, and that's diversity of mindset. You know, all different, you know, kinds of people. It's just so damn clear. I'm not really sure... As you know, we talked about what, why it's this complicated. But a lot of it is the integration. You know, we've got these CDOs, chief diversity officers, that are typically, you know, African American women that work in a silo, don't have accountability for revenue, and <clears throat> you know, I'm not really sure what we're doing. Which brings me to Gina. I'd like to ask you the question. You know, one of the things Jenny brought up was helping women get onto boards. You know, I find, because we help a lot of women, we do a lot of different coaching and training, women, especially senior women, one of our greatest challenges is the bragalogue. We aren't comfortable talking about ourselves. And it's not just, oh, I did this, I did this, I did this. What is your talent? What is your skill? You know, either too nice or we don't want to share about ourselves. What are you finding as you're coaching, you know, women in general? You know, how, how do you work with women to rise up to leadership and own their strengths? Yeah, so I see two primary areas. One is confidence at all levels of the organization. And it's really stepping into your power and owning that. And um, the other piece, and I'll go back to confidence, is I, I think it's more than mentorship. It's finding your tribe and creating a web of excellence of people that can help you. So those can be senior leaders, they can be junior people in the organization, they can be someone that you know that's a competitor, who cares? You know, create this web of excellence so that you have other women that can help you rise um, up into leadership positions. I'll go back to confidence. One, one thing that, um, I've read The Confidence Code, many of you have probably done that. It's one of my favorite books ever. And, one of the things it talks about is confidence trumping competence. And it, it, what that really means is you already know what you know. You're smart. You're really smart. It's the confidence piece that needs to rise. So, you know, what are the stats? Men will apply for a job when they're 60 to 70 percent 
um, qualified for it when they see it, women will only do it at 100%. And to me, that's a confidence competence thing. So, so really rising into that confidence is going to help. And, and break that down for one second. Yeah. You know, one of the studies shows that if there's 10 things you need to do for the job, if a guy can do six out of 10, he's like, yep, I I'm got it. this. <laughs> and if a woman can't do 10 out of 10, she's like, I'm not qualified. And they still question it, right? Right. Well, yeah, we say yeah. shut that bitch up in your head. <laughs> yes. <laughs> and move on. A saboteur, get it out of the way, right? Um, um, and and that's that's part of confidence too. Is sometimes we have some people call it the gremlin, the saboteur. Really putting that aside. The, the last session was talking about naming it. You know, give it a name and say, what are you? Who are you? And what are you here to teach me? Listen to that piece only, and then move it out of the way. Ariana Huffington yeah. calls it the obnoxious roommate. Oh yeah, <laughs> I like that. Yeah, and name it. Everybody's had one, right? So getting that out of the way. So so those are a couple of things that will help you rise. And then knowing your story, knowing what you're really good at, being confident with that, practicing. Mm -hmm. You know, that's going to help you out. I, I have to add into that because I'm in the midst of. Um, interviewing about different for different board positions that have come. So I went to a bunch of friends and asked for advice, and half of the women I talked to said, you've got to go to board boot camp. Like, board boot camp, you know, That's every great. everyone has to go to that. And then I finally met a woman who was like, excuse me, do you know of any guy who went to board boot camp yeah, right. before they get? And then I started asking Absolutely. all my guy friends. I'm like, no, not nope. many, no. They <laughs> usually, they just go for it. And then if there's a specific skill, after you get on the board, then you sure. then you go and you can rev that. But I thought that was I mean uh, that's it great. Is, it is the perfect and it was it. Thank God I had someone another woman who basically said, "Are you crazy? <laughs> Just like you've got skills, go for it and do it." And it's bringing that optimism of the thirty year old into it, like just. Go and do because that's half the battle. Yeah. When in doubt, take action. Yeah. Yeah. Take, a yeah. Yeah. take a step. Take a step. Well, okay. and, sorry, I just want to add one thing because Jenny mentioned the uh, Forbes uh, top 50 most influential CMOs in the world report. Fantastic report. It's like it's all based on solid facts. What's shocking is how many women do you think are in the top 10? Jenny, Jenny do you know? <laughs> three? Oh I think God. three or two. And it's not because they're not awesome and amazing. They're people we know and love. The difference is a lot of the metrics behind the report, and I, I don't want to misspeak, uh, so please correct me, is about social media presence, and hence being influential. And it's, it, it's looked at as a proxy yeah. for, for influence. It's not the only metric, but is certainly one that that research certainly largely incorporated. Yeah. Right. And, 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 and I think it's, it's worth a, a good read because there's some really good examples in there. Um, but in, in the leadership, and actually, Gina, you were with me at this leadership retreat. One of the things that we talked about is um, that women are very afraid to express what they're good at. And a lot of that can be expressed through social media, just even the gumption to be on social media. And if you think about social media as a... Essentially, it's a representation of what women are already amazing at. It's Social media is all about nurturing. It's all about being inclusive. It's all about being part of a community. Women have those skills built in, which would make them excellent leaders. And yet, what was used to be considered as possibly a negative is now the most important skill out there. So women actually have an advantage to being a leader t in today's environment. And it is our tendency to collaborate. And so they were encouraging women to go back to competing. Right. And, you know, and I said, that is just so not okay. Right. Why can't we show that we all get credit, you know, when we work together, mm -hmm. but you usually don't, which right. is why, you know, women are too nice. We're either too bossy or we're too nice or we're too this or we're too yeah. that. But it is important in culture mm -hmm. to give respect and credit to everyone's contributions because we contribute different things. Mm -hmm. I want to do a lightning round. Tell me, you know, we have a board up here, Workplace Wishes. Mm -hmm. Tell me one thing that you wish or that you want to change now. So from a women's leadership perspective, it's really recognizing women for their inherent skills and talents and letting them do their job based on those. You know, don't try and act like a man. We don't need that. We need the perspective of a woman. So lean into some of those things that are, that are great about a man. So maybe being more confident. Like, keep your eye on that, but don't forget all the skills that you bring. So, um, well, I hate to say this now that you just told me you 
about collaboration, but <laughs> I really want people to collaborate more. Um, I chaired a HR retail event uh, about three or four months ago, and I, I got to that event, and all these HR leaders from amazing companies are up there talking about retention and acquisition and user perception and what campaign are we going to run. And I'm like, where the hell am I? Am I in a marketing event or am I in an HR event? And when I asked all these folks in HR, like, oh gosh, you must be working really closely with your marketing teams because you know the employees are your brand ambassadors, right? So who better to help drive the, the values and the purpose and be able to communicate it other than your marketing counterpart? The answer was unequivocally, we outsource all of that. To me, that makes me so mad. And if I were the CEO of any of those companies, I would be questioning how we are spending our money because honestly I think that it is time for marketers and HR departments to work together because employees are the number one brand asset out there and we all have to be working towards their better good. Amen. Yep. Absolutely. Um, my wish is that we have more people who fundamentally believe that diversity equates to growth, and that's the only way to get there. And that's the reason why I love the focus of this panel, and I was looking at uh, I, all the questions, like what programs have worked for diversity and mentoring, all that, I'm like, you know what it really works is like when the top believes that diversity creates growth. Like, and that's what we, we have to convince everyone that that's the only mindset to succeed. So in, in, in my case, it's collaboration, but it's industry-wide. I think, um, just like uh, Shelly, like you started saying, we have a lot of competition among CMOs for which initiative of diversity is the best initiative. And some of the times the conversations that we have with ourselves is about, are you going to join me in my initiative? Please join me in my yeah. initiative. <laughs> and in, in, in reality, so take, take, take a look at the panel that, that uh, Jenny just shared today. There is the need to encourage the agencies to move in numbers and inclusion, which is some of the stuff that myself and Diego Scotti and, 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 and uh, General Mills have been driving. There is the need to create a pipeline of talent, which is a, it, it's, it's an initiative, an internship initiative that Diego Scotti is, is, is doing, which includes internships in the company and in internships in all agencies. And then there's the need to have standards to ensure that the advertising that we create is not gender bias. So right there, you could say, you want to transform systematically the industry, you go and follow, um, follow the, 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 the need for objectives and plans, you create the internships, and then you have the standards. And we all, those, by the way, the three of them are best practices, they're proven. We already know that they work. We should all get together and apply all of them. It's, it's getting very hard to actually get people to say, okay, this is systematic. These are the three things that we're gonna do and we're gonna go in parallel. That's what I would like to change this year. Okay, so what I would like is to change. Is that fair? Yeah, absolutely. That's <laughs> fantastic. I mean, you're the expert. <laughs> <laughs> I am, God. You're the moderator. <laughs> <laughs> That's this tooting horn thing. Um, no, no. Um, but my the the workplace thing that I'd like to change is um, as a mother worker. See what I did there? Not not a working mother. Um, passionate mother and somebody who has a job. Um, I would like to have this change. And I'm not going to say I want employers or workplaces to be more receptive to working mothers or working parents, for that matter. Um, but I want women and parents to feel comfortable speaking up, en enable themselves to be comfortable speaking up and saying, look, and a lot of change is happening in the way, in the way we work today. But speaking up, owning it, and saying, this is what I need. This is how I can be the best that I can be and also be be there for my family, which I prioritize. Um, and I will say that having done that personally, I've never been as, as efficient or as productive, and this isn't any new news, um, an employee and a worker than, I've, than ever before in my career. So that's connecting the dots between business performance right there. Um, so that's what I would love to see change. I think it's Thank awesome. You. I mean, for me, I want to break a hell of a lot of rules and, and write some new ones because I think that's what it's going to take and it's just not this difficult. So I want to thank each and every one of you for such an inspiring, unplugged, real conversation. And I know with all of you leading, change will happen in less than 118 <laughs> years. Yes. And I'm going to say we're going to see remarkable change by 2025. All right. Yeah. All right. Can, can, I, can I just thank you? for being here and for being a demonstration of resilience.
Thank you very much. Thanks, Absolutely. Shelley.